Hi everyone, today I want to show you a small river that drains into the Rio Guejar, the river that flows through the Sierra de la Macarena mountain range. This place is kind of typical for other rivers close to the Andes as well, places where the water has come off the mountains and into the lowland and the temperatures begin to rise. With this rise in temperature, the diversity of fish starts to increase, but only when the rivers enter the Llanos, the floodplain of the Orinoco, the temperatures will be really high and the fish that you find in this type of habitat disappear. They are tied to the habitats that are not as cool as in the mountains, but also not as warm as those in the floodplain of the Orinoco. There are few organics in the water here and relatively little wood. The water flow is high, so it flushes branches, leaves and fallen trees downstream into the lowland. There is enough flow here to carry off most of the fine debris and beautifully clear water is the result. Let's have a look at this habitat in a bit more detail. To the south and west of the Macarena range is the Rio Guayabero, which is a much larger river that crosses through an opening of the Macarena in a gigantic canyon that is several kilometers long with totally straight, steep walls on either side. Many of the large fish from the Guabiero and the Guaviare Basin travel through this narrow canyon to spawn upstream in the headwaters. That includes the giant catfish such as the red-tailed cats, the jawu, and the big tiger shovelnose and brachyplatistoma catfish, all coming from the Orinoco. During the rainy season, these rapids will be much more intense, and it would be very difficult to travel through the canyon. In mid-water levels like this, the long motor kayaks can pass through, and on the western side, the petroglyphs are exposed close to the surface at the entrance of the canyon. We did other videos from this region, from the Caño Cristales, with nice footage of Apistogramma alacrina, which is the most common dwarf cichlids in all the rivers of this range. This river is famous for the red Podostomase plant, Macarenia clavigera. It's a beautiful little river, with this highly endemic plant, a pistogramma, but relatively low diversity. When I went there 15 years ago, the whole region was still not very safe, but today, just about anyone can reach this place easily. Check out the link to that video in the description. We made a second video to show the fish community of the Rio Guejar, which is the river that passes through the top of the Macarena, between the main mesa and the broken off Piedmont on the eastern side. This place is the type locality of Ketostoma joropo, the spotted rubber nose pleco, and the video has really nice footage of Salminos Athenus, which occurs in all of these places. Also check out that link in the description. Today's river is farther north, but it could also be substituted for many rivers that drain water off the Andes. These habitats with their clear water and round rocks look very much like streams in North America or Europe. The river forms some deeper pools, maybe 10 feet or 3 meters deep at most, and then they overflow with small riffles into the next sector. In the dry season, the water flow here is strong, but it is no problem to swim against the flow. These deep pools are occupied by Astyanax feste and the larger Astyanax mete. The latter gets about 20 centimeters or 8 inches in adult size. This open water is teeming with fish, and the only predator I could observe here was Salminus affinis. Strange that these Astyanax were not present in the main Rio Guejar, but other fish such as Prochilodas mariae were everywhere in both habitats. In the Rio Guejar I could observe only one Ketostoma, but this tributary is home to two others, as well as a new undescribed Cordylancistris, Alasi Ancistris, Hippostomus and Farloella. Help us make this channel a success by subscribing and sharing this video on social media. Also make sure to subscribe to our Instagram, we will start to post some interesting photos and shorts of various species in the future. The links are in the description. Moving out of the deep water and into the shallows where the water is moving faster, there is a different fish community. If a rock is turned over, dozens of Astyanax immediately swoop in to grab any leeches, insect larvae or small catfish that are exposed from the activity. I found that the Astyanax schools also follow cars crossing the river to see if rocks moved by the vehicles give them an opportunity to grab something. Salminus and a large pair of Prinicicla did the same, arriving later and perhaps trying to grab a smaller Astyanax. The male pike cichlid actually grabbed a small imparfinus catfish that was hidden under a rock. 
These small catfish never come out during the daytime for good reason. This shallow, fast-moving water is also full of fish. They are Creagrutus maculosus, Creagrutus calai, Parodon, Apyrodon, Leperinus striatus, and breeding pairs of Bujorkina mariae, all occupying this shallow water with a strong flow. The mouth-brooding Bujorkina somehow managed to release their fry between the large boulders and defend them against the mass of potential predators. These cichlids are common here, and it's amazing to see that they're able to breed in this rather challenging situation. The other side of the river has deeper water, and beyond the deep pool lies a steeper riverbank with less flow and a rubble zone of larger boulders. Sediment and some algae cover these rocks, and hundreds of ketostoma feed on the biocover of the rocks, scurrying away like cockroaches in a kitchen. When flipping the larger rocks, it sometimes exposes their eggs guarded by the males. The cordial ancestress is much more difficult to find, and seems to occur only in the strongest flow. It would explain why we ne almost never see these plecos in the hobby. They are not only hard to catch, but also difficult to transport, since they require cool and oxygen-saturated water. Where trees grow close to the water, the riverbank is formed by a dense mass of roots. Water flows even slower here, and different fish occur in this sector. The third cichlid species in this habitat is Epistogramma alacrina, which is found in all the rivers of the Macarena range, and despite the rapids and fast-moving cool water, this very large Epistogramma species seems very comfortable in this habitat. But usually, they are breed in these more dense masses of roots, where the small cichlids at least stand a chance to protect their young. Between the sticks and debris deposited in the root-covered riverbank is where Lazi ancestress Farloella and Hippostomus are found. I was unable to find any of these loricarids on the rocks, but they did occur in the fast-moving water where branches and fallen trees had been deposited. In the curves, the current creates this tangle of wood pieces and many of the loricarids are found in this more three-dimensional and structured sector of the river. While Leparinus striatus were found in the strong flow, these Leparinus orthomaculatus prefer the slower water, picking at the debris and algae on the larger boulders. They are slower moving, and the faster water may be too unsafe because of the fast salminus. If any fish gets too close to the gaggle of young pike cichlids, however, their parents will rush in and chase away the intruder. On the steep bank, hidden deep in the roots, are large-sized wolffish, stalking the smaller fish entering the overhanging riverbank to seek cover from the Salminus and Crenicicla that hunt the more open water. This steep riverbank is also the nursery for many breeding pairs of Bujorkina and Crenicicla. The pike cichlid fry are relatively independent at matchstick size and already form a raiding party that scours the bottom for potential prey. While the female stays in the vicinity of the spawn, the somewhat larger male can be up to several meters away from the young. The riverbank is also home to some other tetras. In the strong flow, we could see Creagrutus and Parodon, but they are totally absent here. Instead, Hemicramus barigone occur in the dense mass of plants. Very large and also predatory charax with a bright red tail remain in the shadows, likely to prey on smaller fish confused by the changing twilight. This fish community consists of species of very much similar size, with the exception of the Andean dorado or Salminus maxillosus, which gets very large. Most of the other fish here are of similar sizes, and it gives this Clearwater River the look of a very large aquarium. Very noticeable are the lack of organics build up at the bottom. Other than the steep riverbank, almost no debris or leaf litter covers the sand and rocks, and large accumulations of sticks, branches, and palm fronds are limited to the curves where they get tangled, but likely get flushed downstream during the rainy season. These factors give this habitat a somewhat polished, pristine look that is notably absent from rivers farther east, where the more gentle slope of the Orinoco floodplain allows organics to build up on the river bottom. It is interesting that these habitats are essentially located between the source of many aquarium fish caught in the Orinoco floodplain and the export hub of Bogota in the mountains, but almost none of these species are exported on a regular basis. Despite the fact that these fish are not highly endemic, but rather widespread, we do not get to see them in the hobby at all. I hope you enjoyed a look at this habitat. Please make sure to share this video and subscribe to this channel. See you next time.